Welcome to Little Lectures, making learning and teaching easy for residents and students on the go. Join our residents from the University of Louisville as they share the highest yield internal medicine topics in digestible chunks. So welcome, uh, my name is Adit. I'm a, a second year internal medicine resident at University of Louisville. And today we're going to be talking about sepsis and septic shock. So this lecture is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is going to be about definitions and diagnosis of sepsis and septic shock. The second part is going to focus on the management. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so before I get into the lecture, I wanna quickly point out that this is a very dynamic field and there's research going on every single day that changes our practice. Um, so what you hear in this lecture might not be true in a couple of years, but there are a couple of common themes that we'll talk about that is probably going to hold true for several years. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, we're gonna start with sepsis three definitions. So this came out in 2016, and um, it basically eliminated some of the older terms that were used, um, including terms such as severe sepsis and septicemia. And it just put out two terms, sepsis and septic shock. So sepsis verbatim is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction secondary to dysregulated host response to infection. And septic shock is a subset of sepsis, and it's defined as severe circulatory, metabolic, and cellular dysfunction, and it carries a higher mortality rate than sepsis alone. Septic shock also um, affects your preload, cardiac contractility, and afterload, thereby affecting your hemodynamic parameters, such as your blood pressure, and can often result in tissue hypoperfusion. Um, so I also want to quickly talk about shock. So shock is defined as systemic tissue hypoperfusion, and there are four kinds of shock. There's cardiogenic, hypovolemic, distributive, and septic. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because whenever a patient presents with signs and symptoms of hypotension and tissue hypoperfusion, it's important to think about these four kinds of shock because the management is completely different. Um, but obviously for this lecture, we're going to be focusing on septic shock. All right, so whenever a patient comes in with signs of hypotension, um, tissue hyperperfusion, you start by getting a great history and physical, as you would with any other patient. Um, on physical exam, obviously you're going to do a thorough physical exam, but look for specific signs for um, infection as well as malperfusion. So look for things like vital signs, um, mental status, skin changes like skin modeling, um, cap refill, urine output, and then maybe put an ultrasound probe and measure their IVC diameter. Now, it's important to remember the baseline characteristics of the patients. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, if a patient has a poorly controlled heart failure or poorly controlled chronic renal insufficiency, um, it's important to uh, you know, take their baseline characteristics into account. They might be hypervolemic at baseline. So whenever you assess these patients, make sure you act accordingly. All right, so how do we diagnose sepsis? Well, um, if we think back to the definition of sepsis, there are a couple of things we need to prove. The first thing we need to do is we need to show that the patient actually has infection. So the way we do that is by looking at objective things such as lab parameters or um, radiographic evidence or you can even look at um, you know, if you have high clinical suspicion for infection, so subjective clinical suspicion for infection, that counts as well. The second thing we need to look at is organ dysfunction from the infection. And the way we do that is by um, looking at these clinical scoring systems. So there are three main clinical scoring systems. The first one is SOFA, which is the most comprehensive one of the three. And it's been proven in the ICU setting. And it actually, if you're positive for SOFA, it means that you have acute organ dysfunction in the setting of that infection. So a positive SOFA score, which is greater than or equal to two, in the setting of infection will give you the diagnosis of sepsis. Um, the second clinical scoring system is QSOFA or a quick SOFA. And um, as the name implies, you use this, you know, it's a quick way to screen for patients with sepsis. So SOFA is, like I said, it's a very comprehensive tool. So um, you need a lot of lab parameters to calculate it, and it could take a while to you know, come back. So in the meantime, you can do a quick SOFA to quickly assess if the patient has sepsis. And this has been validated in the pre-ICU setting 
and it predicts mortality in the setting of an infection. It has three components, systolic blood pressure less than 100, respiratory rate greater than 22, and altered mental status from baseline. So if you have two out of these three, then you're positive for QSOFA, and you have to consider a diagnosis of sepsis and treat accordingly. You also should consider transferring this patient to the ICU for closer monitoring and closer management. All right. And then finally, the third clinical scoring system we're going to use is the SIRS criteria. All right. This is the systemic response to infection, and it has four components, respiratory rate, heart rate, fever, and white count. And the criteria are shown on the screen here. So if you have two out of these four criteria, then you're SIRS positive. So Surviving Sepsis Campaign, um, which came out in 2016 and had a 2018 and 2019 update, and Surviving Sepsis Campaign is the guidelines that kind of tell you how to manage these patients. They actually went away from SIRS criteria and they suggest using QSOFA because QSOFA is a much more specific test, whereas SIRS is a very sensitive but not a specific test. So you tend to get a lot of false positives. However, a lot of clinicians still recommend the use of SIRS criteria because sepsis and septic shock are very life-threatening conditions. And if you, um, you know, they want to use something that's more sensitive, like SIRS criteria, so that they can pick it up and treat accordingly. So in reality, you know, you, there's still utility for both these scoring systems, and ideally you would want to use them in conjunction to make your diagnosis. How do we diagnose septic shock? So remember, septic shock is a subset of sepsis, so you need to have sepsis, and then you also need to have two additional things. The first thing is you need that if the patient, the patient needs to require vasopressors to maintain a MAP over 65. Now we'll go over this in greater detail in the next lecture, but if they're not fluid responsive, then you have to add vasopressors. And if that's the case, consider a diagnosis of septic shock. The second thing you need is a lactate above two. If you think back, lactate is a, uh, is a surrogate measure of tissue hyperperfusion. And if we think back to our biochemistry days, um, you know, if the cells aren't getting enough oxygen, they go from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, which, um, you know, one of the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism is lactate. So if the lactate is elevated, it indirectly suggests that the tissues aren't getting enough oxygen and maybe they're not getting enough perfusion. So it's an indirect measure of um, tissue hypoperfusion. So if, if lactate is greater than two, then you have to consider a diagnosis of septic shock. Um, so this is the end of the first lecture. I kind of briefly went over the definitions and diagnosis of sepsis and septic shock. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the management. Thank you. Thanks for listening and learning with us. If you would like more information on this topic, please take a look at our full-size Louisville lectures, either on louisvillelectures.org, on our YouTube channel, or on our podcast.